for anyone even slightly into metal, Dave Mustaine's influence as a founding father is widespread and almost mythical at this point. We all know about the famous split from Metallica and how good Rust in Peace is, but a key component of his gravitas and legacy is his scalpel sharp political commentary, permeating Megadeth's lyrics and themes all the way back to the 80s, culminating in his current status as speaker of cold hard truth. In other words, he's said a bunch of right wing shit in recent times. However, Despite the universal embrace the right has given Dave, his political track record is almost as convoluted and ambiguous as arguments concerning whether or not Slipma is metal. Dave has made numerous statements and displays of what one could consider leftist ideology, such as hook and mouth off of the album So Far So Good So What, its lyrics lambasting the PMRC for its conservative censorship of music and sarcastically calling the American capitalist system out in its hypocrisy. If you don't agree with that assessment, perhaps my uh, right-wing brother's explanation would suit your fancy. Well, Tipper Gore was a Democrat, so... Additionally, there are quite a few examples of anti-war and anti-corporatism in famous songs like Peace Sells But Who's By It, and Foreclosure of a Dream, eulogizing the death of small farms to massive agriculture corporations. He's two for two regarding the Bushes, and consistently criticizes the military-industrial complex, the latter being a common topic among thrash metal bands, the devastation and tragedy of nuclear holocaust permeating the lyrics of countless bands in both waves of that subgenre's history. But to the dismay of all the libtards, and to the joy of the master race, he's said and lyricized some pretty right-wing things, notably going on info wars and partaking in some good old conspiracy conjuring. That interview is pretty bland and uneventful, actually. Alex tries to throw some spice out there, but they just sound like two guys awkwardly small-talking at the church potluck. Small tangent, conspiracy is also the term the status quo uses to dismiss Marxism or any form of material class analysis. When Dave Mustaine sneered about the corporate military industrial complex or censorship by the conservative PMRC, the ruling interest response was discrediting and disregarding those ideas as conspiratorial. For those long-haired, drugged-up college dropouts are far worse than our long-haired, drugged-up college dropouts. But with Alex Jones, it's the other kind of conspiracy. The ones where they jump through a rhetorical, circus-flaming hole to blame any black, twink, or commie for all their problems whilst sprinting at record speed away from the whispers of Marx and Lenin. Was Mustaine's political ideology reversed by the dunking of his head in the blood of Jesus Christ? Did he get older and wiser and therefore more conservative? Just like my peepaw, who's as ideologically sound and wise as could be. Or, just maybe, his economic interests now align with the right-wing, dominant hierarchical structure that produces such class-denying theories. Dave Mustaine was a young ne'er-do-well, but now he's a prominent part of Metal's version of the upper crust, his identity as brand owner of Megadeth superseding his youthful anarchist ambitions. And that brings us to the main point of this video. Why are there a number of right-wing metal musicians, of whom a large percentage previously displayed various forms of anti-establishment anarchist, or otherwise left-associated ideological positions. First, regarding the fact that there are right-wing metal musicians regardless of wealth, I recommend watching my previous video for a broad rundown on conservatism and metal, and how the capitalist hierarchy uses metal for its own gain. As previously mentioned, a lot of yesteryear's metal musicians who gained fame and significant wealth started out as young boys filled with vitriol and rage towards a system 
that was closer to nuclear Armageddon than some headbanging denim. This dichotomy, displayed by contrarians such as Mustaine, positioned angry boys alongside extreme music, music that was created to spit in the face of the ruling elites and cause mass amounts of pearls to be clutched. However, as metal became more profitable and fat cats commoditized the musical genre, the interests of the now wealthy former boys more so aligned with the system they were previously outraged by. Obviously, not all metal musicians so shamelessly became more feline and rotund, but many of the more durable and more financially successful ones have been the most outspoken right-wingers. This is prevalent in rock and metal, especially from the 70s and 80s. A brief list containing Gene Simmons from Kiss, uh, Alice Cooper, Joe Perry from Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, obviously, Lee Atwater, Tom Araya. And of course, Dave Mustaine. Although, despite unanimously agreeing on the importance of personal responsibility and traditional values, most of them believe music should be separate from politics and that rock musicians are dumb, so who cares anyways? At the same time, using their influence to praise conservative politicians and values. This hypocrisy is a great example of political ideology formed and molded by capitalist hierarchy supporting the status quo and its benefactors, even if you really uh, don't like that dumb orange guy. We'll get to that point later, though. It's also important to note that these musicians, who utilized the rebelliousness and counterculture imagery, were mainly inspired by bands from the 60s, such as the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and many more who, who to this day pose quite leftist sentiments. In addition, Contemporary 70s bands like Judas Priest and Black Sabbath carried that torch of revolutionary radicalism, an aesthetic that everyone else copied. This isn't unique to music, it's what the fascists did with their faux pro-labor and socialist brand image. Similar thing with liberal reactionaries appropriating whatever cause a revolutionary group starts, just to use it for trendy radical t-shirts and stickers to put on their Stanley. Anti-establishment shit is cool a fact that the establishment knows and capitalizes off of. Capitalist hegemony has a profound impact on psychology and how we form our beliefs. We can gain much from analyzing society materially and rationally, but generational disconnects and intersectional tensions require cultural, symbolic, and psychoanalytical considerations. For example, not every metalhead is a poor, white, working-class man, and even for those who fit those descriptors, we often overlook factors that can foster alienation from the revolutionary cause when using a purely orthodox material lens. In short, don't focus or don't overfocus on rationalism. Not everyone is as massive a theory nerd as you or I. Secondly, regarding the previously rebellious spirits of those doped out despondent boys, their outrage, caused in large part by a broken system, was rooted in nothing but reaction and vitriol. What was missing that would have brought them to the root cause of their societal woes, or at least to different and more accurate causes than whatever fever dream Alex Jones pitched? A true radical leftist ideology, one acknowledging that the capitalist structure is what causes the conservative censorship of the PMRC to exist. In addition to the domineering weapons and military industries, that not only bankrupt its citizens, but utterly destroys millions of people worldwide, culminating in the omnipresent peril that is nuclear war. The crux of this point is, if you're a spirited skeptic or a truth seeker, in your youth or when you shrivel up into a leather husk, and you have no understanding of any class or material analysis to ascribe to the ills of society, then your political ideology is hullabaloo, nonsense, concocted purely out of your primal instinct gut feeling and a crippling fear of being lowered a rung or two in the hierarchy of life. Your primal instinct being what the teat of liberalism pumped into your gullet from the day you were born. The dominant ideology has a monopoly not only on public policy and militaristic force, but on the influence it exerts over its populace. 
none of your brilliant ideas or theories on why the world is how it is are truly your own, unless you suddenly spawned in a vacuum fully equipped with perfect calculus skills and a complete understanding of brain physiology. We all stand on the shoulders of giants and so on, you pompous, presumptuous prick. Dave Mustaine, conscious of it or not, was outraged by the life given to him by a capitalist free nation of prosperity and liberty. His family and upbringing being the equivalent of Taken if Liam Neeson was the bad guy and did the taking. His mother eventually became a Jehovah's Witness and voila, you got yourself a homeless, emancipated minor junkie. Because his rage remained uncommitted to radical revolutionary ideology, he had a wild ride in the marketplace of ideas, becoming a student of hegemon darling George Orwell, and ending up in a never-ending smoothie blender of a political ideology, tossing in whatever the fuck suits their preconceived primal instinct. Again, primal instinct being the default ideology a political system cultivates via their widespread influence over education, media, and quite literally anything money can buy. The fact that your immediate association with politics is a laundry list of culture war subjects, abortion, migrant crime, is feminism, critical race theory, etc., is a blatant example of the influence capital has on public political opinion, including the dismissal of class and a critical analysis of, of politics in general. That's another thing. Wait for it. Everything is political. Everything. Think of whatever the fuck you could possibly think of, and ask how that thing came to be. Where was it made? What are the conditions of how it was made? Who owns the companies involved in the, in the development? And what effect do legal policies have on the process? Etc. Etc. Public policy enacted and enforced by the dominant politico-economic class influences every single aspect of life. Go on. Think of literally anything, and now think of how and why that thing or idea was formed, the resources involved, to whose interest that idea's existence serves, and what powers are involved in the continuation or destruction of that idea. Additionally, entertainment in a capitalist society is constructed and controlled in pursuit of maximum profit extraction, and the mechanisms in which profit is maximized is directly connected to the legal system and government bodies that those very same massive corporations and elites can influence one way or another, using the power of capital to further their advantageous socioeconomic positioning. Their advantageous position is entrenched when public media and entertainment obscures systemic causation with classic strategies such as staying out of politics or denouncing both sides. With that being said, art, music, and specifically metal, are even more so political due to their potential extreme position towards the status quo. Anything with the potential for ideological dissonance will be controlled to the greatest extent possible in defense of its profit extraction. Because metal's key feature is authenticity, which is rooted in socioeconomic exploitation and the frustration therein, a corporation or dominant ideology may have a difficult time trying to control it. Therefore, metal is extremely political, and anyone who disagrees with that should read one single book, please. Not by George Orwell. To all you megamind centrists or blissfully ignorant apolitical metalheads, here's a quote by Joan Robinson. Ideology is like breath. You never smell your own. You valiantly refusing to pick a side leaves you with the vanilla, milk toast, milky, milk and ideology, the dominant societal hierarchy, hands out to everyone. The ideology of personal responsibility, individualism, conformity, and, of course, blaming anything other than class for your society's ills. Good old American values, etc. Even without actively choosing one side or another to cheer for, you are undeniably shaped by the socioeconomic conditions around you, and you enforce the interests of the dominant default ideology whenever you act normal, whether that be perpetuating bigotry, adhering to orthodox societal norms at the expense of those who do not, faithfully defending the current capitalist structure against demonic Marxism, and so on. 
the list of normal behavior also includes preaching about the divided nature of politics, and that we just need to forget about it for a Pink Floyd song or two. Why do you think this sentiment is so widely echoed in our capitalist society, despite nothing ever being done to better such a polarized world? And why is there an instinct to equate depravity on the left and right? Could it be that the dominant ideology, in an effort to discourage critical political analysis and thus preserve its grip on top of the societal hierarchy, fosters obscurant excuses as to why the people should not be politically conscious? If the source of your near infinite opulence is able to be influenced and manipulated via the marvelous power of the dollar to further entrench the structure suited to your financial interests, would you not utilize that resource to make sure the source is under control? Unless you think everyone in power are just oblivious bumbling buffoons as politically unconscious as your average Disney enthusiast, that is at least easier to vomit out as opposed to an exhaustingly nuanced class critique. The genius of any slave system is found in the dynamics which isolate slaves from one another obscure the reality of a common condition, and make united rebellion against the oppressor inconceivable. This quote from mustachioed megachad Michael Parenti highlights the concerted efforts of the ruling class to utilize not only physical force, but ideological and cultural influence to control an exploited class, namely using individualism, a classic Western virtue. more like fifth, but maybe Mr. Parenti can convince you. Regarding various apolitical and new age groups in 1920s and 30s Germany, by propagating an apolitical philosophy of life, they have done little to thwart the retrogressive forces that accumulate wealth and military power, destroy the environment, obliterate indigenous cultures, build authoritarian organizations, and oppress millions of people throughout much of the world. Having ignored political realities for so long, they added little strength to the anti-Nazi movement. If anything, they gave Hitler space. He also mentions how these apolitical hippies who wanted to return to their roots inspired the Nazis to incorporate the ancient Germanic Volk culture into their nationalism, revived by those seeking to escape politics. To further hammer home this point, we'll discuss It's Okay to Be a Right-Wing Musician by Become the Night, an undoubtedly polarizing figure in metal YouTube history, with such hot takes as hating black metal, arguing against critical race theory, and why lefties suck. Oh, wait, he's talking about guitars there. In this video, he goes over how he has left and right-wing views, even saying he's not a conservative, but we should be able to chill with one another and drink some beers and forget politics, you know, for a Pink Floyd song or two. Except for a very specific and strict set of values he created for himself and will defend valiantly against blasted politics, not realizing those very same values are inherently political. I remember as a young lad listening to nothing but illegally downloaded Megadeth and Iron Maiden albums on my MP3 player, stumbled upon Become the Night, AKA Mike the Music Snob. I took it as blasphemy when he said Dream Theater was better than Megadeth, and how the Tornado of Souls solo is overrated. I proceeded to ignore him for many years. Jokes aside, this video is a good example of the default political ideology one inherits when a material class or Marxist analysis is ignored, and how in the West that default is right wing. He starts by saying how this video does not represent politics or right-wing ideology whatsoever, but to make musicians feel comfortable being who they really are, even if you're right-wing, while adding that this isn't the fullness of reality. And this does not necessarily represent the fullness of reality. So Mike's just yapping. His left side comes out when he mentions how critical he is of Spotify as a corporation but is quickly cancelled out by his staunch resistance to critical race theory, infecting music with its reason and nuance. In addition to a chat he had with anarcho-capitalist Jeffrey Tucker, 
and an impetus on personal responsibility and accountability. All right, what are we up against here? Anarchist, fascist, socialist, Whig, liberal, centrist. I am a right-wing liberal. Conservative. He states the belief that music is a unifying force but for a dividing one. And in this day and age, there's an increased pressure from all sides to be a political activist, as if politics was the basis of morality. This is basically his major point in the video, again stating they blur the lines between policy and what it is to be a good human. Filthy politics needs to stay away from my good clean morals. I have to ask, what is politics and why is it supposedly so unrelated to humanity? A definition of politics is, politics refers to the art or science of government. It involves the study and practice of governing, shaping policies, and making decisions that impact a society or nation. Politics extends beyond formal government structures. It encompasses the total complex of relations among people living in society. This includes interactions, power dynamics, and conduct seen from a political perspective. I can't believe I had to define politics to you fence-riding, impotent, political equivalents of my senile, drunken grandmother. Regarding why pol politics is thought of as a separate entity, disparate from human goodness, you know the answer, but I'll say it anyway, it's capitalism. Recall everything previously mentioned. We do not live in a happy, pluralistic society where social, economic, and political institutions operate with benign intent where power is definitely not concentrated in the hands of immense wealth. Famous economist and pioneer of capitalism Adam Smith has said, Till there be property, there can be no government, the very end of which is to secure wealth and to defend the rich from the poor. Those in control of societal norms, economic structuring, and public policy craft the system to suit their interests convince the populace that it's somehow in their best interest, and discourage any critical class analysis as to why everything's fucked up, the result of doing so being branded a radical Marxist. There is an undeniable correlation between political systems and the well-being of society. A democratic political system aimed at serving the people's needs will undoubtedly be to the benefit of the most people. But as Michael Parenti stated, if ownership of private capital is concentrated in a few hands, democracy is impaired. And thus, the well-being of society is impaired due to the political system. Politics does not need to serve the interests of the wealthy few. We can have a political economic structure where the interests of the people are prioritized. A system where being a good human as opposed to ruthlessness, is incentivized. Endless consolidation and frivolous competition can be replaced with pursuing the actual, material, and psychological needs of the people. When you reduce politics to just some dumb mumbo-jumbo that angry people like to yell at each other about, it erases the fact that people are in control of politics. People that have arbitrarily declared themselves worthy of more than you are. Mike says he's sick of lying about what we know to be verifiably true. So hopefully he listens to my point here, because it's verifiably true. He even talks about how he tries to do the most good for the most people, and doing net goods for the broader political spectrum. Great, glad to have you on the side of capitalism's downfall. Cheerleading aside, is it fair to assume that you believe critical race theory to be a net negative? You know, discussing the impact of centuries of chattel slavery and legal unfairness of blacks and the socioeconomic impact it had on generations of Americans, that is a net negative? But anarcho-capitalism, one of the most vile abominations in political ideology you could only find in the wet dream of Rand, don't get vaccinated, just buy the antiviral medication my wife invested millions in, Paul, is a net good? He finishes by saying, we should aim to build strong fortresses and defend them from people who come to take the fortress, suggesting that some things it's okay to take a stand for, in this case, his fortress, 
i.e. whatever the fuck he decides is a net good. I don't mean to completely disparage everything he said in this video. I generally agree with him highlighting the need to be a good person and refusing to fall victim to dogmatism. However, his own track record of dog dogmatic stands for things undeniably harmful to or ignorant of others leaves his high-minded calls for civility a bit hollow. And you just gotta listen to this. Trump supporters need to recognize that the songs they love are a direct attack on the politics they support. Okay, you could probably make that argument for some songs, but the specific example he used at this part was actually Another Brick in the Wall. Another Brick in the Wall does not have any innate political biases. It's just blanket anti-establishment and freedom of thought. Also, we see in real time a centrist reaction to the impact of cultural hegemony under capitalism. Art, no matter how silly, stupid, or frivolous, is a political act. What? He states that you either aim to subvert the status quo or reinforce it. Just gonna come around and say it. That's bullshit. I definitely don't hate you as much as middle school me did, but damn, you still live up to your divisive reputation. To tie it all together, the prevalence of right-wingers in metal is due to, one, changes in hierarchical position that align their interests more so with the dominant socioeconomic status quo, and two, the lack of a material class analysis to better understand the problems provoking the outrage and vitriol apparent in metal. And the additional or intentional lack of any political understanding grants you the gift of the garbage can of ideology, handcrafted by those desperate to preserve their positions of power and influence, and keep the unruly masses from getting any ideas. Additionally, for every right-wing metal musician, you can name two left-wingers, the manufactured relationship conservatism has with metal is just that, manufactured. From the recycled bottom feeder articles highlighting bold metal rightists, who most of the time are just bitch-ass centrists, to the self-proclaimed victimhood right-wingers cry about when declaring love for old 45, it's not meant to convince you they're right, but to just throw it out there, that it's okay to support the status quo, and they're worthy of respect and consideration regardless of whether or not they feel the same way about anyone else. Because at the end of the day, the dominant powers don't need your respect and consideration. They'll exist either way. 